diabetes, there is bad news, but there's also good news. The bad news is that diabetes is a stealth disease, a slow and silent killer that has reached epidemic proportions. The good news is that positive lifestyle choices can prevent, slow, or even reverse prediabetes and type 2 diabetes and greatly improve the management of type 1 diabetes. There's hope for the diabetic and prediabetic. Major modifiable risk factors for type 2 diabetes include overweight, midsection fat, lack of exercise, unhealthy diet, and poor sleep habits. And there are more. It includes high blood pressure, elevated triglycerides, and abnormal cholesterol, as well as smoking. Diabetes is linked to greater risk for heart disease, stroke, kidney failure, blindness, amputation, and dementia. All individuals with diabetes should have a thorough medical examination to assess possible undiagnosed complications. Pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes have a dietary face. The dietary face of diabetes is consuming a diet low in dietary fiber and high in meat and dairy products, fried foods, sweet and white flour products, and sugary drinks. We could call it the chips, chops, and lollipops eating style. But there's also a dietary face of recovery. There's hope for better health. A powerful therapeutic intervention for diabetes is a whole food, plant-based diet. Great sources of plant protein include beans, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. Beans, peas, and lentils contain the most fiber of any food group, running as high as 10 to 15 grams per cup. Beans are an excellent source of protein, and they're inexpensive. They can be eaten every day, even every meal. Beans fill you up and keep you fuller longer, balance blood sugar, and lower cholesterol, triglycerides, and blood pressure. Try adding garbanzo or other beans to soups, salads, and whole grain wraps. Be sure your grains are whole grains. Whole grains are hearty, flavorful, and filling. After breakfast blood sugars of volunteers who ate whole grains was 46% lower than those who ate refined grains. Brown rice has more than twice the fiber as white rice and six times as much magnesium. Enjoy old-fashioned or steel-cut oats instead of quick oats. Here's another winner when it comes to weight and blood sugar control. High fiber, colorful vegetables. Enjoy an abundance of vegetables. Look for bright colors, leafy greens, and that raw crunch factor. These foods are rich in nutrients and antioxidants that mop up cellular byproducts, unlock cells to receive more glucose, and lower stress hormones. Colorful berries and fruit also contain trace minerals, potassium, fiber, and phytochemicals which help lower blood pressure and inflammation. Walnuts contain heart-healthy omega-3 fats and so do flax, chia, and hemp seeds. It's healthy to include a few raw nuts to your diet every day. Sprinkle over cereal or on salads to add flavor and nutrition. Olives, avocados, and olive oil contain flavorful, healthy, monounsaturated fats. They're a healthy addition to salads and savory dishes instead of butter, bacon, or cheese. Healthy food choices are not enough when it comes to defeating diabetes and prediabetes. The face of prevention and recovery includes exercise. Regular exercise is a key component for improving fitness, energy, and blood sugar control. One reason is that exercise helps defat muscles and improve insulin sensitivity. A 10-minute brisk walk in the morning and after meals is a great way to start. Stay well hydrated. Water displaces calorie-laden sugar drinks. It improves circulation and boosts alertness and energy naturally. Hope is at the heart of a healthy lifestyle. Changing lifestyle habits requires connecting with others, trust in God, staying focused, and never give up. God will help you stay focused, faithful, 
and hopeful as you learn new habits each day. God's promise is sure. He promises renewal. I have strength for all things in him that gives me power. God will give you the strength and power to live a better, healthier lifestyle. The choice is yours. The power for the journey is his. He will not fail you. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? For who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or the sword nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us father thank you so much that we serve a conquering christ a risen savior we ask that as our worship ascends through the merits of a crucified and risen savior that your name will be glorified that your witness will go out to the world that Christ is still in control. That there is a God that we can trust because he's given us Jesus Christ, the righteous, who satisfies your requirements. Bless us now with your spirit, we pray. And may our worship ascend in your name, we ask. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, amen. Our opening hymn today is hymn, six, hymn 166, The Lord is is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say Hallelujah. Praise your joys and triumphs Savior. Anybody glad about it? We welcome you to the services of the Somerset Seventh-day Adventist Church where we reach out and touch lives and we trust and pray that as we reach out today to God to worship Him we're so glad that you're with us by way of the internet where we can still praise our God and be in His presence. What a wonderful Savior we serve today that we can come into His house into the virtual space and still praise our best friend, Jesus Christ. Anybody glad about it? Let's sing our welcome song this morning as we are so happy to be here in Jesus' name. We welcome you. Because if you're happy, and you know it, say amen. Amen. Say amen. Amen. If you're happy 
somebody and right about now we like to say that if you've had a birthday this week if you've had an anniversary this week we praise God for for you we do know that there is a new babe that, that's been born we want to thank God for the fact that Ingrid and Lee J are the proud parents of a baby bouncing girl huh Indra Indra thank you <laughs> We want to praise God that Norma is a grandmother. And uh, Velma, we want to thank God for that. What do you say? Amen. So we celebrate with you. Um, and uh, we want to praise God that God has blessed you with new life in your house. And we trust and pray that new life will bring more life in Christ. For every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above, in whom there is no very minister, no shadow of turning. Greatest life, equalness. Father, we give you thanks. Because we know that you are the life giver. We ask that you will bless this baby and this household with your blessings, with your presence. And God, we just want to say thank you for the joy that Jesus brings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We are still in prayer for Norma Smith and in the loss of Sister Barker. We are still in prayer for June Deal and the family, the loss of Kent Deal. We are still in prayer for the Backles family as they mourn the loss of Brother Harold Backles. We are in prayer for the family who lost the young man in the shooting. We're living in a time where we are experiencing the uptick of COVID and lives are in the balance even in the King Edward Memorial Hospital. So we have need to pray. We do have need to praise, but we certainly have need to petition God this morning. I'm so glad that God has conquered even death, how and the grave. And as we read in our scripture this morning, we serve a God who cannot be stopped. We serve a conquering king. And today we take courage in believing that God is able. Had a sweet talk with many who have been prayed for through the Super Tuesday experience on Tuesday nights. And it's their testimony that the Lord is good. So we must magnify the Lord in this place and thank the prayer coordinators and the Somerset Church for Pembroke Church and the Restoration and Rockaway Ministries for our collaborative effort to continue to keep the Lord before his people even during these pandemic times. So at this time we're going to be also in prayer for the people of St. Vincent who are being evacuated from a situation that man can handle. It's going to take a God to arrest that volcano and bring safety to thousands of God's people who are on that island. So may God bless them and keep them. And all who are suffering in our world today through violence and whatever financial situations and this fear that you have, I trust and pray that this service will be a blessing to you, that you will sense God's presence and that you will take hope and courage to know that God is still on the throne. He's large and in charge. And he still answers prayer. We're going to ask Elder Hank after the 
praise team gives us a few notes of meditation to come and lift up these needs and others before our Lord in prayer. Wherever you are, the Holy Spirit's with you. Because the Holy Spirit is surely in here this morning. He says we're two or more together. He is in the mix. And we're so thankful for that. So let us pray. Dear loving, kind, heavenly Father, we're so thankful for who you are. Father, we're so thankful that you love us so much. And Father, I'm asking that you would be with people that lost loved ones. We think of Norma Smith. We think of Sherman Swan. Father, even as Sister Bach was laid down, Father, as I heard the work that she done on this earth, Father, I know that she's going to have stars in her crown. And Father, I thank you, Father, that you used her in a mighty way. Father, anyone that prays for each and one of our family members and calls them by their name, Father, that's special. Father, that's sweet, that's loving. So, Father, I thank you for using her in a special way. And, Father, I pray that you will be with others that are suffering. Father, I think of Brother Baffle's family. Father, I pray that your presence will be with them in a special way. And Father, I pray that they would remember the change that they saw in him when he accepted Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that it, that, that it would encourage them to, to seek the Lord. Father, we're living in times, Father, that we need to continue to study your word. Father, we need to, to, to continue to teach people your word, share this word. Father, I pray that you would be with Sister Hassel in a special way, Father, as that, that, that she's going to lay down her son. Father, I pray, Father, that you would be with Sister Lee that, that, that is going through, through ailments in the hospital even right now. Father, be with that family, Father, because, because they even lost the, she even lost her sister during, that, during this time. Father, we're living in times, Father, that many people are, are, are losing loved ones. But, Father, we could take from heart, Father, that you said you'll lay down the righteous so they don't have to face these evil days. So, Father, we could be thankful for this. Father, we could say, say thank you for, for, for protecting them. Father, your word says it's a solemn thing to die, but it's a more solemn thing to live. So, Father, I'm asking that your presence come upon us. Father, I pray, Father, that you would lead us, that we would do your will, Father, touch our heart that we will surrender all to you. Father, we need you, Father. And Father, I pray, Father, that even in this time as we go through this COVID, Father, I pray, Father, that you will keep us focused. Father, I pray that you will keep each and every person focused on this Sabbath, 
Father, let us keep it sanctified and holy as it is, Father. Please, Father, because we could easily go to stray on this time. Many of us are so used to being in church. But, Father, we are home, so, but, so sometimes we, we, we could get distracted by doing something when we shouldn't be doing it. But, Father, please, I'm asking that you will keep us focused. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be upon us, Father, and I pray, Father, we will be obedient to your Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray, Father, that you'll be with those people in St. Vincent's. Father, the way I look at it, Father, the cup of iniquity is spilling out. And Father, we know for a fact that Jesus is not going to drink it again. So please, Father, I pray that you continue to be with those people. Father, I pray that you will bring each and every one of them to safety. And Father, I pray through this experience that if someone has not accepted you, Father, I pray that their eyes will be open. Because, Father, so many things are happening now that is not normal. So please, Father, I pray, Father, that, that your presence will come upon us. Wake us up, Father. Father, we're living in times where, where, where men think they have the answer. Father, we're living in the times where men are looking to scientists for different things. But, Father, you say man's wisdom is foolishness. So, Father, I pray that we will seek you for wisdom and understanding. Father, I pray that we will seek you for the truth, Father, because now we realize that we see these things. Father, we know you're coming soon. Father, please, Father, prepare us for your coming. Father, prepare us that we will be your servant in this time. Father, lead us that we will realize that we are all ministers. Father, let us be a witness to someone somewhere along the way. Father, you say every disciple has a soul to win and a soul to lose. Father, I'm not interested in losing those souls. Father, because you gave up your only begotten son, that all of us could have eternal life. So please, Father, I pray, Father, that you will lead us to be your sons and daughters. Father, I pray that you'll lead us that we will be that peculiar people. Father, as we studied in the, in the Sabbath lesson this morning, this morning, Father, let us be separate from this world. Father, let us be, be the head in all that we do, Father. Please, Father, I plead, Father, that you will present upon us. Father, may you reveal to each and every one of us what you have for us to do. Father, you have plans for each and every one of us before the foundation of the world. Father, I'm asking that your presence come upon us, that those plans will be fulfilled. So, Father, bless us as we go through rest of this day. Father, keep us focused. Father, keep our minds stayed on you. And, Father, thank you, Father, for that we could ask and know that we receive your Holy Spirit. And, Father, thank you for the Sabbath to know that you are ever closer to us, closer than any other time. And, Father, thank you, Father, to know that you're going to answer this prayer this day because, Father, it says that on the Sabbath more prayers go up to you than any other day. And, Father, it says that you don't wait till the Sabbath over to answer it. So, Father, I'm asking that you will save our families in your kingdom. Father, I pray, Father, that you would touch our neighbors, Father. Let lead us that we will be better witnesses in our neighborhood. Father, please be with our families that, that, that is outside the yard for safety. Father, realize, Father, that a lot of work can have to be done in a short time. Please, Father, may you continue to fill us with your word, Father, because the time is going to come, Father, it's going to be a famine of your word. And your word is our standard. So, Father, we need this word. Jesus said, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds on the mouth of the Lord. So, Father, bless us and fill us with this word. Speak to us today, Father. Strengthen us this day that we will keep our eyes upon you. Father, we want to say thank you again. Father, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the name.
brothers and sisters, it's tithes and offering time. But Father, we know that no one could be in the churches at this time. But Father, I plead, I plead, brothers and sisters, that you would stay faithful. And Father, and Father, brothers and sisters, we uh, have many ways that, that you could get your tithes to us. You could call the Somerset Church and uh, make a ransom with June. One of the elders could come by and, 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 and receive your tithes and offerings. So Father, I pray that you all stay faithful, that you will always be blessed. Because God made a covenant with you that he gives to you and he just asks you to return just a portion of it just a portion and I realize that the money that you have that it leaves with you when you think about it it does not add up to pay all your bills but for some reason or the other all your bills get paid God is good I could give you a testimony when I first came in the church the Lord did not let me work for three whole months and I didn't have a bill at the end of the three months. And I think the Lord was just testing us to see. And, 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 the, and the brother that got baptized with me, about a few years later, he was coming to the point. He says, I ain't gonna not work. And what am I going to do? I said, that faith and trust that we had in the Lord, when we first found him, three months he took care of us. Three months he took care of us. God is good, brothers and sisters. God is good. I, I want to read something for, uh, to you from Council of uh, Stewardship. Persons who thus pledge to follow man do not generally think of acting to be released from their pledge. A vow made to God that give it all favors is, is of the still greater importance. When they should see to be re released from our vows to God, Will man consider his promises less binding, bending because, because made to God? Because his vows were not to be put in, a, in trials and courts or justice. It is at least void. Will a man who professes to be saved by the blood of the infinite sacrifice of Jesus Christ rob God? Are, are not this vows and his actions made in the balance of justice? in the heavenly courts. The Lord is going to bless you and even as we understand even in the Sabbath lessons this morning, if you're not going to be blessed, you're going to be the curse. So let's have a word of prayer. Dear loving, kind, heavenly Father, I pray your Holy Spirit will go upon each and every one of them, Father, that, that they will realize, Father, that, that you have a order act, order them and ask them to, to, to return a tithe. Father, just because it's not a church, that doesn't mean we don't have to pay tithes. Father, we are living in your world. Father, this is your house. And Father, no matter where we go, Father, where we stay, Father, we have to pay things. So Father, may you continue to encourage us and continue to strengthen us, Father, to be obedient to you. And Father, may these tithes go to out to all over the world, Father, where your gospel will really be preached. Father, because your word says, Father, there should be no strain or no problem, Father, because we return our tithes. So, Father, bless us and keep us in all thy ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's love. That's love. Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me. That's love. That's love. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head. For me, he died. That's love. That's love. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head. For me, he died. That's love. God for his love that God will send his only begotten son to die for our sins not only did he die but he rose again because he loved us he gave himself for us that we might have eternal life somebody want to be glad about that today I want to thank the praise team and Jonathan for their ministry, what do you say? Thank you so very, very much. And before we get into today's message, I want to also ask the church to be in prayer for Sister Manders as her uncle in the States is actually being funeralized as we speak. She's trying, she's trying to tune in to the service. Um, so Let's keep her in our prayers. What do you say? Her uncle Keithan has passed. I want to be a little generous today. Before we get into the message, we finished a No Fear Prophecy Edition series where we were offering this powerful book, Understanding Daniel and the Revelation. And I feel a little generous that if you're viewing and you're not a member, you're not affiliated, with the Seventh-day Adventist churches, and you're viewing, please write us, please call us, 441-535-7018. The pastor would like to make sure that you get a copy um, of these end-time biblical prophecies that will help us to navigate our way through these dark times. What do you say, church? So we want to thank God for that opportunity that we have to share the message, the three angels' messages in book form, where you in the quietness of your space can read yourself into the truth of God's word. Amen, somebody. We are impressed to stay with the resurrection theme because I serve a risen Savior. And uh, thank God he rose again. I'm going to turn our attention to the book of Matthew. Because I want to hear 
his story, you know, as each gospel writer has testified of the resurrection. Today I want to read Matthew's account. It's found in the 28th chapter of the book of Matthew, and I want to begin there at verse 1. And I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, although on the screen you will see the King James Version. And you may read and follow with me as best as you can in whatever version the Lord has provided you. But I will read verses 1 through 10. That's Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. And the Bible says, After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been risen. He has been raised, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead and indeed is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Hallelujah, somebody. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Going back to verses 6 and 7. He is not here, for he has been raised. As he said, come see the place where he lay. And of course, the end of verse 7 says in the New Revised Standard Version, this is my message for you. I've entitled this text or this sermon today, The Angel's Message. The Angel's Message. Let us pray. Father, take now lips of clay. Speak a word to your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. I think it's safe to say that Christianity hinges on the resurrection of Jesus. Last week, we read Paul's account where he said, For if Christ is not raised, then our faith is vain. And we are yet in our sin. So more than a pastor in the pulpit, more than a praise team in the choir loft, more than a building with a steeple and a cross on top, more than stained glass windows, our faith hinges on the fact that a man named Jesus got up from the grave. Romans chapter 10 and verse 1 tells us that the first step in becoming a Christian is to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Paul says, for if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. That one of the fundamental beliefs of being saved is that in your heart there is an unshakable conviction that Christ was raised from the dead. We believe that he was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death. But early Sunday morning, on the first day of the week, he got up from the grave, somebody, 
And it is this proclamation of the resurrection of Christ that makes Christianity unique among most world religions. For most world religions have some kind of ethical or moral code that sounds like the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Just about every world religion has some form of sacred writing or scriptures that they read from. Most world religions have a form of prayer or meditation. Every world religion has some doctrine or thought about the afterlife. Every world religion has some religious leader or prophet that people follow or even listen to. But the one thing that dis distinguishes the Christian faith from all other religions is the belief that Jesus died, that he rose again, and we don't just share this belief, we celebrate it with joy. Because if there's any message worth celebrating, if there's any message that ought to put some joy in your heart, if there's anything that should anchor your hope, encourage your faith, strengthen your walk, put clapping in your hands, singing in your song, if there's any message that should put fire in your bones, the word of God in your mouth, life in your soul, and the Holy Ghost in your heart, it's the message of a risen Savior. And that message merits our soul's celebration. I thank God for the angel's message. Now, ironically, the thing that brings us celebration about his resurrection, the thing that brings us joy on that day Jesus rose, there was anything but joy in the hearts of his first disciples. For them, they had just witnessed the tragic execution of the man they loved. They had sacrificed their whole lives to follow him, and they had been following him for three whole years. Imagine, if you will, being in Jerusalem and trying to go through the motions of the Passover, but being afraid that the very same religious forces that killed your leader are now looking for you. Imagine the disappointment and the frustration of wondering how this powerful Jesus could have ended like this. Was Jesus really who he said he was or who he claimed to be? And if he was, how could his story end this way? How could the one who walked on water die on a cross? How could the one who opened the eyes of the blind, the one who cast out demons, the one who healed crippled bodies, find himself dying the death of a common criminal? No, there was no joy, no excitement. There was no enthusiasm at the dawn of that day. There was disappointment and depression. And could it be that's why every gospel writer begins the resurrection story by telling us that it was a dark morning. And I want to suggest that the darkness was not simply the absence of the sun, but that it was the loss of hope. It was the darkness of disappointment. And may I say it's the same kind of darkness that you and I feel when we are exposed to another senseless shooting in Bermuda. May I suggest that it's the same kind of darkness that you and I feel when we see an uptick in COVID cases. May I suggest that it's the same kind of darkness that you and I feel when we see mass shootings in Atlanta leaving behind broken families. And instead of Georgia legislature, enacting gun reform, they are busy passing more suppression laws that look more like Jim Crow. The darkness we feel is the same darkness we feel when we watch Trump insurrectionists hijack the Capitol in Washington, D.C. and not be arrested, and yet a black man is arrested and handcuffed in his own yard for being black. The darkness we feel happens when we witness a 65-year-old Asian woman brutally beaten on the streets of New York City in broad daylight by Brendan Elliott while bystanders closed their door and watched and did nothing. The darkness we feel 
is watching the murder all over again, the execution of George Floyd on TV, and a defense team that would have you to believe that George Floyd brought his own death upon himself, that Derek Chauvin is not responsible for killing him, even though you and I saw it on TV. That's the darkness we feel. Could it be that the darkness we feel today is the dis disappointment of realizing that 53 years ago last Sabbath, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee, and black and brown people are still struggling for equal rights and justice. That's the darkness we feel. That this pandemic seems to escape the, vaccin the vaccination by its constant mutation, taking more than a half a million lives in the divided states of America, and 14, and I just got a text, 15 lives in our own island home. Maybe the darkness we feel is not being able to have a proper funeral for a loved one, but having to bring closure the best way we can. There is a darkness we all face, and it's not the darkness of the first day of the week. Could it be that it's the darkness we deal with every day of the week? But now looking at the first dawning of that dark day of resurrection morning, the Bible says that God sent an angel, somebody. That in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of depression, in the midst of, of disappointment, God starts that Sunday morning by sending an angel to a gravesite to meet two women who are making their way to give Jesus a proper burial. Resurrection morning begins with a God-sent angel who has a message for those who have experienced darkness. And notice the women got a God-sent message while they were pressing their way through the darkness to anoint Jesus. Don't miss that. That in the darkness, God dispatches an angel because he has something to say to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary who are pressing their way through the darkness to anoint the body of Jesus. That no matter how dark the night, God has a word for those who press through the darkness. Ah, don't care how dark your day or your night. You don't have to give up. God's got a word for you. And that word came from the angel. The angel said, he is not here. He has risen. Go see where he lay. Now, the word see in the Greek doesn't just mean look. But it means go understand. Go and search. Go investigate. See, the angel told them, come see where he lay. These women got up early that morning to anoint Jesus and to give him a proper burial. But the angel wants them to know that God is still moving. Mm. It's been dark. It's been rough. It's been hard. They went to the grave because they wanted to honor Jesus with a proper burial. But God says to them in the midst of their darkness, he is not here. And church... In the midst of moral darkness and depression, we serve a God who always has something to say. The one message of the resurrection this morning is that we have to learn, however, how, the trans how to transition from asking the why question to the what is God trying to say question. Don't miss that. Because the disciples were asking why? Why? Why did God allow his son to die this way? But we must shift from asking God why things happen to us to ask ourselves, what is God trying to say by allowing these things to happen? Because this is how you and I are going to mature in our walk. It's when we stop being held up by wondering why things happen and start asking, what is God saying to me in this situation? What is the Lord revealing to me about myself in this situation? What am I to learn about, about God and how God operates in the midst of my situation? 
angels show up at grave sites to tell two women who are honoring God, I got a message for you. In the midst of darkness and depression, God has the same kind of style today. He has a message for us. He has a word for us. God always has a word for those who are facing times of darkness. And I want to suggest in the text, here it is. He is not here. Now, you're looking for Jesus, I know, and the reason you've come here is because you, were, you, you last saw his dead body and you woke up this morning thinking that this morning will be like yesterday and the day before. You thought today was going to be just like yesterday and then everything today would be what you experienced yesterday. So you have come here believing that nothing has changed. Understand this, beloved, that the women, according to the other Gospels, had gone to the gravesite to anoint Jesus, and they did so first thing Sunday because Jesus died on Friday, and then the sun set. They didn't have time for a proper anointing of his body. For his burial was just before the Sabbath, and because the Sabbath begun at sundown on Friday, because the sun went down, they couldn't prepare his body with a proper burial. And let me remind us that from sunset on Friday to sunset on the Sabbath, God's people still don't work. And let me say this. Christ did not abolish the Sabbath on the cross. He, if he did, he would have told his disciples that after I die, don't worry about keeping the Sabbath. In fact, there's a prophecy in Matthew chapter 24 where God says that the, the Romans are going to come in and take down Jerusalem, which took place in A.D. 70, some 40 years after his death, burial, and resurrection. So if Jesus wanted to do away with the Sabbath, why is he telling them uh, 40 years after his death, burial, and resurrection, pray that your flight be not in the winter nor on the Sabbath day. I thank God for the Sabbath. It's not been obliterated. It still stands today. It's still binding. And I praise God I can worship him on the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath of the Lord. These ladies kept the Sabbath and prepared his body after the Sabbath. First thing Sunday morning when they had the first opportunity, they came to anoint the body of Jesus Christ. Now, by anointing him, they were saying it's all over. I want to say it's not over. It was one of the darkest days of my life, but the angel said, it's not over. Come on, somebody. And I don't know what you're going through, but it ain't over. I, you feel like giving up on God? I came to tell you, it ain't over. One thing fails you, it ain't over until God says it's over. It's called the intermission. You know, you may have seen a Broadway story or show. I've seen one. And in the middle of the performance... One thing I thought, I thought the thing was over. I was confused. How did they stop like that? Right in the middle of the performance, the actors left the stage. In the middle of the performance, the lights went down and, and the curtains were drawn. I couldn't understand what was going on. It's called the intermission. I thought it was all over. But I soon learned that the actors left the stage, the lights went down, the curtain was closed to show us, and that to show us that it was not over, it, they said, folks, this is the intermission. See, at the intermission, they close the curtain. At the intermission, they change the scene for the grand finale. And that's all done during the internet intermission. The actors have left the stage. The lights go down. The curtain is drawn. And I came here to tell somebody that God is on the other side. It's not over. He's setting the stage for the final events. We see this pandemic. It's not over. God is setting the stage. Come on and talk to me. Some actors have left the stage, but it's not over. There's a part two. This is only the intermission. Stay tuned for the second half, for the second coming. Somebody needs to understand this Sabbath morning. It ain't over. God is still large and in charge. No matter what it looks like, it ain't over. Now, to show us that it ain't over, the angel says, he is not here, but is risen. And that's the message of the Christian church that got me excited when I became a Christian. Listen to what the angel tells them. He is risen, which should make you shout. 
But check what the new revised standard version says, because that version is supposed to be closer to the accurate Greek translation. And in that sentence, it's, it's not in the active voice, but it's in the passive voice. So it, it, the sentence should read, and here it is, it should read, he has been risen. Stay with me now. I'm not going to get too deep on you. But Acts 2, 24 says that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, I know Christ is the resurrection and the life. And I know he said that I, I, you're not taking my life. I'll lay it down. And when I'm ready, good and ready, I'll take it back up. But the text says also in Romans, we read it earlier, that God raised him from the dead. I hope you're listening to this. I said he has the power to raise himself from the dead. But God raised him from the dead. Oh, that's the message right there. God did something in Jesus when he resurrected him from the dead. Jesus didn't do it by himself. Here's the message. God did it. <laughs> and that's what I came to tell you. Pause right here and listen to me what I'm trying to say. Because right in your life story, I'm sure there's a testimony that you can give to the world. where You are in situations and you can say today, God did something. Can I get a witness in this place that you were down and out, that you were broke, but God did something. You were sick and in the hospital, but God did something. Come on and talk to me, saints. Can anybody testify today that God did something on your behalf, that you serve a risen Savior? You didn't do it by yourself, but God did something. And I don't know who I came to talk to, but let God work. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but God is doing something. It's intermission. Let God work. can't do it by yourself. Take your hands off it and let God do it. Hey, there is nothing sweeter than knowing that you had nothing to do with it, but God did it. Can I get a church in here today? It's nothing better than knowing that God put you here. Not a, com not a conference committee. God put you where you are. Not some board. God opened up a door. And I hope you're just as excited when God closes the door. <laughs> Because a shut door could be God saying, I'm redirecting your steps. Because it ain't over. That God has resurrected Christ from the dead. What is this saying to us? Death could not stop God. And here's your Sabbath shout. He is not here. God is still working. He is risen. And watch this. Nothing can stop God. I know it looks like churches are closed, but nothing can stop God. I know it's gonna, it seems too simple for you to shout on it, but if God could defeat death, what in the world can stop God from doing what God wants to do in your life? Oh, you didn't hear that, so I'm going to say it again. If God can raise Jesus from the dead, what in the world could stop God from doing whatever God has planned to do in your life? I came by here to declare to somebody today that we serve a God who can't be stopped, a God who can't be blocked, who can't be defeated, a God who will do what God himself will do. I've been watching ESPN. And during this NBA season, I don't know much about basketball. I know a little bit about cricket. But there's a great debate as I look at the television screen about who is the GOAT. The greatest of all time. That's what GOAT stands for. And there are many different opinions out there about who is the best basketball player. Some will rightfully argue that it's Bill Russell who has 11 championships with the Boston Celtics. That's pretty good. Clearly, someone else will, will argue, no, that's, that's good, but they'll argue that Magic Johnson is the, is the GOAT because he put the league on showtime. And then some would argue that, no, it's the black mamba, Kobe Bryant. God bless him as he rests. But, 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 but they, they say he's the greatest because of his scoring ability. And then some would argue, no, it's King James, LeBron James, because he took, look at how many finals he played. Look at how many rings he has. But the host of the show said no. While all of that is good, I understand Bill Russell and his accomplishments. I understand Magic Johnson, what he did. I understand Kobe Bryant and how he played. I understand what LeBron has done and is doing. But he said, you can argue with me all you want, but without fear of contradiction, I came here to tell you that all your opinions are wrong, that the greatest of all time is none other than number 23, Michael Jordan, at least on the court. That on the court, Michael Jordan can be beat. 
how do we know that he is the greatest? And here it is, because Michael Jordan is the greatest, because Michael Jordan went to six NBA finals, and he never lost one. And you can't be the greatest if you get to the championship and you lose. You cannot be the greatest if you step on that, on that platform and fall short. LeBron ha is great, but he's not the greatest. He's lost too many times. But if you get Michael Jordan on the court, Michael has never lost the NBA championship. And in order to be the greatest, you can never lose. Well, let me tell you something. I found somebody who has never lost. For our God has never lost. Can I talk about him? He's never lost a battle. I said he's never lost a case. He's never been defeated. And even he, he even defeated death on death's home court. He is the greatest. That's why greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That's why all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. That's why whatever is against you can stop God from working with you. God is the greatest. How do we know? He's not in a tomb. He's risen again. And he cannot be stopped. He is the greatest. But the third thing the angel says, and hear the attitude in the angel's message when he says, He is not here. He has been risen. And watch this. As he said. <laughs> In other words, you should not be surprised that he has been risen because that's what he told you. He told you he was going down and that he will come back up. In other words, saints and those of you listening, you can take God at his word. Don't be surprised. In fact, Taking God at his word is the issue that many of us have. And that's why Jesus rebuked his disciples in Mark's version of the story. For Mark shows Jesus in disgust when he comes to the disciples who are on the road to Emmaus. He is so disappointed in them because they are slow to believe that he has been risen. Jesus is upset. Why? Because he said, I told you. That I will be raised. And that's why we can trust God even through this pandemic. We can rejoice even in tough times because we serve a God whom we can take at his word. That what God promised, he will perform. I wish I had somebody who knows that God will do what God said God will do. For God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. That whatever God declared, he will do. And is there anybody here who knows that we serve a God who can make all things work together for your good? Is there anybody here who knows that weeping may endure for a night, but God promised joy in the morning? Is there anyone here that can declare that the weapon was formed, but it didn't prosper? Because you serve a God who keeps his word. Then watch this. The angel says, now come see where Jesus lay. Come look at what used to be, but it's not anymore. <laughs> come look at what has been changed. Let me pause here. I'll pull over. I'll keep the engine running, as my friend Donaldson likes to say. And I want to suggest to you and somebody who's listening here that when your life becomes a witness, you can point to what you used to be. But what God has done now, can I get a witness? My life used to be broken, but he made me whole. My life used to be down, but he picked me up. I used, I used to be sick, but he made me whole. I used to be addicted, but now that stuff ain't got no pull on me. I serve a risen Savior, and that's what my God can do for you. The angel moved the stone, not to get Jesus out, but to get the women in so that God can have a witness of what God can do. Jesus could have kicked the stone up. He could have spoke to the stone and the stone would have moved. So, 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 and not, matter of fact, he came out as king of kings and, and kings don't open doors. Oh, you missed that. <laughs> the angel rolled the stone away. That's another sermon right there. The stone was moved, not so Jesus could get out, but so the women could get in and be a witness that he is not there. 
Because God needs a witness. And when you can point to your life and tell people where you used to be, but now where you are, you are a witness for the Lord. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 19, verse 15, no one person will stand in court, in a Jewish court, and be a witness. You have to have at least two or three witnesses. Are you listening to what I'm saying? And that's why there were two women there. But now it gets a little deeper, Jonathan. You see, the Pharisees not only had the scriptures, but they had the Talmud, which was commentary on the scriptures. And the commentary on the scriptures says that a woman can testify. I'm sorry, ladies. But God broke the Talmud because he allowed two women to show up at the gravesite. I know Peter and James came later, but the first two to witness that Christ had rose from, risen from the grave was, was two women. Are you listening to what I'm saying, ladies? Ah, so I thank God that he can break protocol and do what he's got to do. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Yes. But watch this now. These two women were told by the angel, now that you've seen the empty tomb, go tell the disciples the good news. So the first evangelists were two women. Go tell the, the disciples who were scared, who were in the upper room, afraid for their lives. Go tell them the things that you have seen. And they went in obedience. But the text that we read says that while they were going in obedience, that they met Jesus. And Jesus told them the same thing that the angel told them. They couldn't stop. They, they held his feet and they worshipped Jesus. But Jesus told them the same message of the angel. He told them the angel's message. Go quickly and tell the disciples. But you have to ask yourself, why did Jesus hold them up to tell them the same thing? I mean, they were not in doubt that they saw the empty tomb. So why did he tell them the same thing? Now, that I want to say to you this. Well, the, 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 the empty tomb is information. But when they, and that's information that they could have taken back to the disciples. But when they saw Jesus for themselves, they had a personal revelation. You see, it's one thing to be in a church and have all this information. But it's another thing to have a personal revelation. That he walks with you. And that he talks with you. Are you listening to what I'm saying? We need to go beyond information. And you need to have a close walk with God. And nobody can take your walk from, from you. They not only saw the empty tomb. But they saw Jesus as a risen savior. And once you have that experience. They had an encounter. I dare say that's what the Christian church needs. Not just right doctrine. But we need an encounter with God, the risen Savior. And then, of course, we can go and tell somebody that we serve a risen Savior. I'm so glad for the angel's message. I'm so glad that we have been given a message to go and tell the world. Jesus showed up, told them the same message that the angels told them. And I want to say that Jesus is telling us the same thing today to fulfill the gospel commission. They and we like they can be his witnesses. I'm closing. You see, the true witness to unbelievers is not just about the sign of his resurrection, an empty tomb, but it's about the encounter of his, his resurrection. And that's why we sing the song, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, no matter what man may say. I've seen his hand of mercy. I felt his touch of care. And just the time I need him, he's always there. I don't know about you, but... I'm so thankful for the information that I've gotten through the three angels' messages. The Bible, Daniel, and the Revelation. Liberating truths, end time prophecies. And I thank God for these prophecies and these teachings. 
I also thank God for a personal encounter with the man Christ Jesus. And I can tell you, just like the angel said to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, go see where he lay. He is, he has been risen because God did it. He is not here. And I can say the same thing. No, I'm not what I should be. But I praise God I'm not what I used to be. I serve a risen Savior. And I want to challenge somebody listening to this message, the angel's message, that he can change you too. For if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and confess him with your mouth, humble yourself and call upon him, he will forgive you of your sins and he will save you. Father in heaven, we thank you for the angel's message. What a liberating message. And I thank you that you still break chains and you still set captives free. Oh God, live in our hearts today. Break the bounds of sin. And may we continue to live in Christ, our risen Savior. We thank you that not only did you live, love, suffer, bleed, and die, but you rose again. And now you sit on high, interceding, mediating. And nobody can stop you or block you. Because one day you're coming again. Bless our hearts, Lord, to know you. Whom to know is life eternal. And as this song is being sung today, I trust and pray that you will have the courage of conviction to email us. It's on the screen. To call us. Let us know that this message has touched your heart. That you're tired of, sick and tired of being sick and tired. That you're not asking why questions, but what is God saying to me in these times? these COVID times I came here today to encourage you he was crucified but he rose again and he did it just for you listen to the song, be blessed and may you receive Jesus as your savior today above all powers Hallelujah. above all kings above all Yes, yes, yes. And you 
participar. Então se der para o Thank you, Jesus. Now may God be in us to sustain us, beneath us to uphold us, above us to shelter us, behind us to protect us, before us to guide us, both now, henceforth, and forevermore. Lord, be with grieving families, be with those who are hurt, those who have lost loved ones, those who have lost jobs, those who have lost family, those who have lost friends, those who have lost positions. But the one thing they don't have to lose is you. You are the God of the oppressed. You are the God of the downtrodden. You are the God of the broken. You are the God of the hurting. You are the God of the loss. And today, you are the God who breaks chains and sets captives free. Here are prayers for our colleagues, our friends, family, and loved ones. Cover us in your righteousness. We accept you as our Savior. Save us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. You've been tuned in to the services of the Somerset Seven Day Adventist Church. We reach out and touch lives. We trust and pray that this service has been a blessing. Write us, call us. May God bless you, is our prayer. Amen. Amen. So may God be in us to sustain us. Beneath us to uphold us, above us to shelter us, behind us to protect us, before us to guide us, both now, henceforth, and forevermore. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, may God's people say amen, amen, and amen. amen.
say